You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning from Washington, D.C. Good day to you wherever you're joining us from and at whatever time uh, in this day and age. We're delighted to have you for a program uh, that looks at Malaysian politics, and it is entitled The Street and the Ballot Box, the Bursi Movement, 2018 Elections and the Implications for Malaysian Politics. Uh, this is a, a new book by uh, Professor Lynette Ong, and we have as our discussant, Professor Dan Slater, and we're delighted and grateful to both of you for joining us this morning uh, to discuss this book and in general, uh, the state of Malaysian politics. For those who are joining us um, and will know very well, uh, there was a very important election in a very important state in Malaysia uh, over the last couple of days, uh, and the results are being parsed and discussed online, and, and I'm sure in academic settings as well as in Putrajaya and elsewhere. So it's a really good time to take a look at, at the context of Malaysian politics, and we have this new book to launch uh, as part of that effort. You have the details of our speakers um, in your program, and um, I will not belabor them except to say I can't think of two uh, more well-qualified folks to speak on uh, Southeast Asian and Malaysian, in particular, politics today, and we're uh, grateful to have them. So let's maximize the time uh, with their expertise and therefore engagement with them um, at the latter part of the session. So we'll have Professor Ong do a PowerPoint presentation. She'll walk us through her presentation and then we'll invite Professor Slater uh, at the, uh, from the University of Michigan to offer some comments and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So welcome all, welcome uh, speakers and over to you, Professor Ong. Okay. Great, can you see my PowerPoint? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Satu and East West Center for hosting me, for making this happen. Um, and thank you in advance to Dan Slater for discussing. I'm, I'm very honored to be here uh, to be talking about my new Cambridge Elements book, The Street and the Ballot Box. Um, it is a case study of uh, the Bursi movement and its implications for 2018 election and, uh, and, and Malaysian politics. So why the street and the ballot box? I think you know, traditionally social movements are seen as challengers seeking to enter the institutional work of polity members in the words of Charles Tilly, who have routine access to the levers of power. In other words, traditionally, people who are involved in social movements are seen as outside the institutions and people who are within the institutions uh, operating in two different terrains. There's not much interaction between them. But actually, social movements and elections are actually not discrete and separate events. So if you think about people on the street, what they do actually has an impact on what happens in terms of institutional outcome. So they are actually mutually constitutive forms of politics that often interact to shape the prospects for, the, for both short-term and longer-term social and, and political change according to uh, McAdam and, and Taro. So these three books are about American politics. They have one thing in common, which is they, they examine the interactions between social movement and party politics, which is a form of institutional politics. So Scotch Poll looks at the Tea Party movement and how that has actually polarized uh, the Republican Party. Party in the street, uh, looks at the anti-war movement and how that has actually contributed to the election of President Obama. And most recently, Sidney Terrell's book looks at movement and parties, how they interact you know, within the last few decades in, in American political history. So there's actually more interaction between movements and, and institutions than we have commonly assumed. So I bring the analysis uh, the interaction one step further. So I looked at the interactions between movements and institutions, and instead of stopping at political parties, I bring it one step further to political coalition, to, 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 to opposition coalition, and then try to use that to explain electoral change or regime change, right? And bringing that to 
authoritarian context, we know that from a range of works that how electoral rules are often manipulated by autocrats to preclude fair competition. And autocrats can also tilt the level playing field by buying votes and doing and playing all sorts of tricks to preclude uh, the opposition from getting elected. So the, so the opposition inherently faces a coordination problem. So then I think the question then becomes, so when institutional channels prevent the opposition from competing fairly, right? what are the possible non-institutional routes that are available to the opposition to win an election? Right? So when your road ahead is actually blocked, what are the, 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 the other possible alternatives? So my arguments in brief, so if you look at X causes some Y, but I think there's a black box in, in between X and Y, and the X being uncoordinated opposition elites and discontented masses, right? A bunch of very unhappy people in the country. And then Y is electoral change. So what I'm trying to explain is actually the black box in between X and Y. The black box is a non-violent broad-based movement that mobilizes across society, across social cleavages, which then helps to build coherent opposition co coalition that helps to bring about why, which is electoral change. So, and, and what is a broad-based movement? It is a movement that advances a common grievance widely shared across society. It does not divide society. So if you look at ex examples from American politics, Tea Party movement, anti-war movement, those are not really broad-based movement because however you organize it, you leave out visible groups. Uh, but the broad-based movement is one that could actually unite the, the society instead of dividing society. And the methodology I've adopted in the book is one of process tracing of 20 years of movement rallies, various movement rallies and how that interact with electoral outcome, often the year after the rally, as well as social political changes uh, over a 20 year period in, in Malaysia. In authoritarian context, the book on your left, uh, Defeating Authoritarian Leaders in Post-Communist Country by Valerie Burns looked at how stolen election in Eastern European bloc, stolen election, rigged election, how that causes mass grievance. People were so angry that they turned out in the street in hordes, right? And that they were driven by emotions, but they, it also changes their cost and benefits calculation of participating in protests. And that in turn led to elite defection and then regime change, right? Those autocrats were booted out. So the, the sequence is one of stolen elections, people's power, mass, mass movement, elite defection, and then regime change. Now the book on your right, Ordering Power by Dan Slater, uh, looks at how contentious politics shape elite coalitions and then shape regime outcome. So even though I don't think Dan explicitly framed it that way in his book, Ordering Power, but his argument was that, as I understand, there was violent uprising among Southeast Asian countries which then led to cohesiveness within ru ruling elites because the elites face opposition on the streets. And that's why they need to come together and be united. And that um, unity and cohesiveness in turn led to authoritarian regime durability. Now, my argument is actually diametrically different, which is one of a nonviolent broad-based movement right, actually led to cohesiveness among opposition coalition. It helps bring the society and the opposition elites together. And that in turn contributes to authoritarian regime change. Um, and as an afterthought, you know, this, is, this diagram actually refers to the same regime some 60 years apart. Uh, the UMNO regime, you know, uh, right after independence and in 2018. But that is purely an afterthought. So let me go into the case, which is Bursay. Um, I probably don't need to, ex to explain everything to this audience, but Bursay is really a coalition for clean and fair elections established in 2016. It was at the beginning an elite initiated social movement. 
not one started by the grassroots, but one initiated by opposition elites. It was set up by opposition elites from the DAP, uh, which is a Chinese, you know, dominated uh, political party, the past, the Islamic party, the PKR, which is uh, led by Anwar, uh, working together initially with 25 civil society organizations. But after that, uh, let's say two, three, four, five, basically they were able to, to corral together a large number of civil society across the country. Now, Bursay's secretariat at the beginning was actually driven by a pro-DAP research for social advancement, which is, you know, chaired by Liu Qintong from DAP. So, so you, one could see Bursay really as an attempt by institutional actors, which is opposition elites, to mobilize society through extra institutional route to support their cause. So they went out to the street because they knew that the institutional roads were blocked. They went out to the street in order to mobilize a uh, society to bring about uh, a change in institutional outcome. Now some background to, to Bursi. Now let me start with 1997, by the Asian financial crisis. There was concern, huge concern about KKN corruption, uh, um, and uh, cronyism and nepotism. There's also increasing income inequality. This is towards the end of the boom years, economic boom years in under Mahathir's rule. Uh, and then Mahathir sacked his deputy, An Anwar, which caused uh, an elite split. And then that gave rise to the reformacy movement that very much evolved, uh, which was you know, modeled after a similar grassroots movement in Indonesia at that time that called for good governance. Then the movement, reformacy movement, then evolved into a pro-Anwar political party. So, so this is, if you like, the movement to party type of interaction that people in American politics have been writing about. That evolved into PKR or Keadilan, the Justice Party. So I think that laid the foundation for a civil society opposition alliance and Meredith Wise calls that uh, coalitional capital, right? The coalitional, the capital that brings together the coalition between civil society and, and opposition parties. Um, so let's look at 99 election, general election. This is a year after reformacy rallies. So the, so the opposition alliance was then formed, called the Barisan Alternative, consisting of the PKR, the Keadilan, uh, the Islamic Party PAS, and the, China, and the Chinese dominated party DAP. And then Barisan Nacional lost two thirds majority of, of popular vote for the first time. So I think this is the first illustration of how a movement uh, and an opposition alliance that is rooted in the movement is able to better able to bring the society together, right? Which caused some dent in the support for, for the Barisan Nacional, the ruling coalition. And that led to a decline in Malay support for UMNO. Malay votes was distributed actually to pass, not so much to PKR. And the PKR's lackluster performance could actually be attributed to the rather relatively narrow support that reformacy movement has garnered, which had largely centered around young middle-class Malays. Uh, and the cause for reformacy, which is justice, particularly for Anwar, lacked resonance among rural Malays and non-Malays, and it actually did not reach East Malaysia at all. Um, and then 19, but 1998 reformacy rallies and then that interaction with the 99 general election, I think could be seen as the very first of cycles of electoral contention in uh, Malaysia in McAdam and Terrell's term. Then, and then um, Mahathir retired in 2003 and then Abdullah Badawi took over AMNO leadership. Uh, Badawi, you know, um, championed an anti-corruption campaign, and then that led to a landslide victory by Barisan Nacional in 2004 general election. BN's popular uh, vote rose from 56 to 64 percent, whereas the opposition alliance halved from 40 to 20 percent. So I think 2004 general election became an inflection point for opposition coalition, right? 
um, the question becomes one of how do you actually engineer a regime change when the rules of the game are rigged against you? Uh, and when the level playing field is so much unlevel that uh, if you just play by the rules, there's no way that you could win. So they have to come up with some sort of creative solution. So a group of uh, opposition elites, uh, uh, there's a group of them, but the chief among them were DAP strategist Liu Chintong, uh, Muhammad Sabu from, from, uh, from PAS, uh, Tian Chua from PKR. So a group of them then had a meeting um, with civil society leaders, which then led to the formation of Bursa. Now, these group of opposition elites are brokers. In McAdam, Tarot, and Tilly's terms, they are brokers. Brokers, in that sense, are people who have one foot in the street and one foot in political parties. So they are able to bridge between the two terrains, extra institutions and, and institutions, right? So Bursi was very much an elite-initiated movement. Um, so, and what are the other key features of Bursi? So you have the universal, universality of electoral reform, which I mentioned earlier, which I think appeals to people across the spectrum. It is inclusive, it doesn't, it doesn't exclude anybody. It is also secular, it creates no losers. So it's a little bit like, like stolen elections in, in Eastern European sense, that, that it appeals to a wide range of people across uh, society. As compared to reformacy, which revolves around uh, urban malaise, themes of Islam and justice for Anwar. Bursi is much more inclusive. Um, it also advocated for change through universally respected institutional channel of electoral change. It doesn't call for a revolution, people's power. It actually calls for change through institutions that is recognized by everybody. So it actually play by the play by the rules. It also adopts a strategic choice of nonviolence in Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stepan's term. So I, I, I spoke to Maria Chin Abdullah, uh, Bursi leader from, from 5.0. She said to me, you know, despite being a non-democracy, Malaysians actually do not live in an oppressed society. No one is poor or desperate enough to take up arms or sacrifice their lives to bring down the government. So the nonviolence was a strategic choice. But, but then, you know, I, I think the other way to look at Bursa is that people in Malaysia have wanted a change in the government for a long time, right? But the strength of the Bursa, according to Shishamuddin Rice, a prominent grassroots activist, was that people understood that they were cheated, cheated in the election, cheated in society by affirmative action. The government was bluffing, blah, blah, blah. But since the 60s election, people have known that they were cheated. But suddenly an organization comes out and tells them, it is okay to come together and show solidarity. That is why Bursi was so, was so popular. So, so in a way we can see Bursi, I think, as a legitimate platform that converts people's private preferences, right? People talk about, complain about government all the time in Malaysia, but they do it in private homes. They do it in Kopitiam, they do it in coffee shops. But Bursi actually legitimately brings people together and convert their sort of private preferences into public uh, transcripts. Um, so right after the first Brissett rally in 2007, you have the 20, uh, 2008 general election. So first Brissett attracted some 30,000 participants. And, and this kind of tells you how I looked at the causal chain, right? So you have Brissett that brings, is a platform to unite opposition and civil society which then built Pakatan Harapan, uh, Pakatan Rakyat, uh, PKR, DAP, and PAS, which we then led uh, to be in losing two thirds majority of seats for the first time. Um, but then, you know, Bursi 1.0 came under criticism for being too close to the opposition, that it is actually not a civil society organization, right? It's one that is actually, and, 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 the, 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 and I think the criticism was, was justified in many ways. So the opposition at least then passed the baton on to civil society leaders. Uh, from Bursa 2.0 onwards, it was purely a civil society organization. So on the left hand side, you have Ambiga Srinivasan, who, who is a prominent uh, lawyer in, in Malaysia. She chaired 
Brexit 2.0, and then Maria Chin Abdullah in the middle, and then Wong Chin Huat on the right, who is a university lecturer, but also, also you know, uh, an activist and a strategist. So these are the political, uh, these are the civil society leaders. Um, then, then you have Brexit 3.0, um, 2012 uh, election, which then attracted even more people, 300,000, 10 times the size of Brexit 1.0, which then also built an even stronger uh, opposition coalition that actually led the BN to lose its popular votes for the first time. What it also did was because of the because of various campaigns, electoral campaigns that uh, that um, Bersi championed, it boosted voter turnout to historical high, to eighty five percent in twenty thirteen, um, and before that, before Bersi was it was about you know sixty five percent, and if you look at Johor election in the last couple of days, it was around forty to fifty five percent. That was very low compared to, to the mandate that uh, the, the parties had in, back in 2013, which was at 85%. Um, and then, you know, 2016 came the one MDB corruption scandal. I, I won't go into the detail what the scandal is about, but I'm sure, you know, if you are here, you probably would have heard of it. Uh, one MDB is a sovereign wealth fund. It was accusation of the former Prime Minister Najib Tun Razak stealing a lot of money through various means into his own pockets, that being um, facilitated by Joe Law, and then that involves Hollywood, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, a lot of juicy details, blah, 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 blah. And the chart here came from the latest issue of The Economist, and since Russia has been in the news, you could see Crony Capitalism Index, Russia ranked, num ranked number one, and Malaysia actually ranked number two, which gives you a sense of the severity of cronism in Malaysia. So what does 1MDB uh, feature in, in, my, in my story? So in, I see 1MDB as a political opportunity, political opportunity in social movement terms. And the way how political opportunity works is it facilitates, is, 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 like, is, like, is like an engine that drives the movement forward, right? Um, and it drives the movement forward in two ways by increasing the number of discontented masses. And it also um, increased the discontentment among the elites, right? So James Chin, a university lecturer, a long time observer of Malaysian politics, uh, said to me, Malaysians are actually not unused to corruption, but Najib has only shared a small fraction of the stolen funds with his supporters, about 10% of the 680 million. But I, actually, I think it's more than that. Uh, the, the actual sum stolen was actually more than that. This was what made the Malay community so angry. And even his so-called cronies did not actually benefit from his stolen funds. Um, and a uh, Chinese newspaper editor, this is in Sarawak, said, you know, no one was happy about the Najib government spending money, especially the luxurious lifestyle his and his family led. The people here in Sarawak were angry enough to join birthday rallies, a protest culture that, that Sarawakians had never really embraced. Uh, the jailing of Anwar and Reformasi had never been, never affected, has never affected the Sarawakians. It was very much a Malay and Peninsula Malaysia issue. So you could see the resonance of, of, of 1MDB and the, 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 its reach, how that has actually created disenchantment among both elites and the masses. But I, but I think all this dis disenchantment is then funneled through Bersi because you have Mahathir joining Bursi, uh, joining Bursi 4, first time not wearing a Bursi t-shirt, but when he appeared, he was cheered by the crowd. And then second time, he actually officially wore a, a Bursi t-shirt, which is you know, uh, shown as in the picture here. And right next to him, you have Mahathir's son, and then you have Muhyiddin Yassin, who is also from, um, from Amno. And after that, two of them quit Amno and set up Bursatu. Uh, another pro-Bumiputra political parties. 
So Brexit by that time has actually revolved into a global Brexit, right? So you have a uh, huge turnout in Brexit for people were a lot of yellow people were wore yellow t-shirts and protests against the backdrop of Petronas Twin Tower. But at the same time, you have you have rallies being held across 34 countries. And the largest was actually in Melbourne, which is which has a huge diaspora, uh, Malaysian diaspora. There's also a rally in London. Uh, there's even a very small contingent in, in Toronto. So, so I call it, you know, it actually creates an imagined community, an imagined global community of people, of, of yellow t-shirt wearing people who yearn for social change in, and yearn for, for, for social and political change in, in Malaysia. And Bursi was actually to bring these people together, which is very unprecedented in Malaysian history. So Bursi 4.5. 4.0 and 5.0 and how that interact with 2018 elect electoral change. So the, the difference here is the one MDB corruption scandal created uh, uh, disenchantment among the elites and the masses. And that led to uh, building of uh, an uh, even stronger opposition coalition, even though PASS pulled out at that time Pass is the Islamic Party, but the more moderate uh, faction of Pass Amana, led by Mat Sabu, joined uh, joined the opposition coalition together with Basatu, led by Mahathir, and then uh, you have PKR and then DAP. They were able to run to win a landslide victory, which then lead to electoral change, right? Um, and this table here really sums up how different uh, cycles of contention over 20 years, from movement rallies to opposition coalition and to electoral outcome. Starting from 98, you have, you know, Reformasi, which led to Barisan Alternative DAP, PATH and PKR, BN losing two thirds of popular votes for the first time. And in 2007, Bursay 1.0 with 30 to 40 uh, thousand participants, which led to the formation of Pakatan, Rakyat, PKR, DAP, and PAS, and then BN losing two thirds majority of parliamentary seats. Uh, and then Bursay 2.0 with even more people. And by the time that was the beginning of global Bursay, and it was Bursay 3.0 that attracted more and more people, 300,000, uh, which causes BN to lose popular votes for the first, for the first time. Uh, it was there was a record high voter turnout at eighty-five uh, percent, and then August twenty fifteen Bursi four point zero rally with five hundred thousand participants, basically riding on riding on this one MDB scandal, anger against uh, the ruling elites, particularly against Najib that broke out in July twenty fifteen, uh, and Madia made it the first appearance at the rally, and then. A year later, November 2016, Bursi 5.0 rally was held. Mahathir appeared at the rally uh, wearing uh, a yellow Bursi t-shirt. Uh, then Pakatan Harapan was, was formed, um, consisting of PKR, DAP, Bursatu, and Amana. Mahathir and, C and other senior Malay leaders then defected from Amna. Right. And then you have May 2018 elections, uh, BN lost, PH you know, won majority seats and formed the government. And the voter turnout was very high at 83%. Okay, so that's basically what my book was about. And I use this other cases from, you know, Eastern Europe to Africa, kind of to do external validity and comparison. It's all there if you are interested in that. But let me spend a minute or two on what happened, you know, post Malaysian election, a lot, uh, a lot has went on, has gone on, you know, a lot has changed since, since then. Uh, to everyone's surprise, you know, Mahathir resigned in March 2020, which left the Pakatan Harapan government in limbo. Um, no one actually knew what happened at the elusive Sheraton Hotel coup. So it was Sheraton Hotel, a lot of uh, uh, ruling opposition elites at that time, which is unknown people were called in and then they had this meeting which people can only speculate. But it appeared that, you know, Mahathir was then outmaneuvered by his own deputy in Bersatu, 
who is you know Muhyiddin Yassin and and some other people. Um, so so I think the way I look at it, and I think we can see see Mahathir's resignation and Sheraton coup as an extraneous event, as an exogenous event that actually unraveled the Pakatan Harapan governing elites. Not something actually endogenous within the model, but but an unexpected event that actually unraveled the whole thing. Uh, but it is sure, for sure, that the 2018 election was an electoral change without democratic consolidation. So I know in the two years, uh, some people have been working very, very hard to bring forward Bursay's uh, agenda, which is electoral reform, to change Malaysia's electoral reform, electoral system from one of first past the post which means you need to get certain seats to win the election by a simple majority. You can win the election by a simple majority to some sort of proportional representation to better suit the demographics of the country. I think that is actually key. But in the two years that Pakatan Harapan was in government, some, I know that some people worked very, very hard, but did that, that reform did not actually go very far. Um, so, Unfortunately, you know, there was no democratic consolidation at all. Uh, Johor state election that Satu mentioned. Um, so Johor is a state that is right next to Malay, uh, right next to Singapore. A lot of uh, people from Johor actually worked in Singapore. Voter turnout was like 50%. A lot of people in Singapore, work in Singapore, did not actually bother to go out, did not bother to vote at all. So BN, BN, so BN1, uh, Barisan National 1, um, but without much mandate though, right? And, um, and, I, and, I think, and I think Malaysian politics has reached the point where it was in, 20, in 2004, right after Abdullah Badawi took, took over power. Uh, you have encouraging results in 2003, right after reformasi, but then, and then Badawi won a landslide which forces opposition coalition to come up with creative strategy and Bursay being the strategy. And, then, and I think now we are at that inflection point uh, again. So I'll leave it here. Thank you so much. I very much look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Lynette. That's a, a great uh, introduction to the subject of your book and bringing it up right up to the elections in Johor. Um, let us now turn to Professor Dan Slater, whose considerable expertise on Southeast Asia in general, but especially Malaysia politics as well, can add to this discussion. And then we'll move to uh, participant uh, input as well and questions. Please, Professor Slater. Okay, thanks Satu. And, and thanks most of all to, to Lynette for writing this book. I was just ecstatic when I saw that it had come out. Um, I should say that the, probably the, what I've done more in my field work from you know 1998 to 2017 has been talking to you know opposition politicians, activists in Malaysia, and almost none of those interviews have made it into either of my books just because of the way those books were structured. So to actually have you put it all into writing is just is fantastic, and it kind of inspires me to want to go back into my notes and write something myself. But I, I don't have very much time, and I have a lot to just a lot of reactions. So let me try to be quick. So I think um, there's two really big payoffs to this to this work. Uh, one theoretical, one empirical. The really, really big theoretical payoff to my mind is on the, the emphasis on pre-election mobilization as opposed to post-election mobilization. So not color revolutions, but the buildup over time. And I know Meredith Weiss is here, the coalitional capital idea, it really builds on that. Um, and so this idea of it takes, it takes a long time, it takes you know, this mobilization. And then empirically, just providing us this marvelous case study of Bursi and of, of the pockets on Harappan. I mean, it's just, it's such an amazing case of what it looks like to take, you know, two decades to build up the kind of opposition, both in opposition parties and in civil society that can actually defeat a regime that it has completely skewed the playing field, uses repression, all of these things, and actually defeat an electoral authoritarian regime, uh, despite a, an unlevel playing field. Um, my main comment is going to be on, on cohesion. I'll also say a couple things about um, credibility, and uh, inevitably, I'll have some things to say about Mahathir Muhammad as well. Um, my, my, my really big point here is that cohesion is for autocrats. Pluralism is for Democrats, okay? 
the opposition in Malaysia was only cohesive in the most limited and liminal sense. It was a negative coalition, as Mark Weisinger would put it. It was a grand coalition, as Lynette puts it. It was a united front, which if you've read, if, you've, if anyone's read Tuong Vu's wonderful work on East Asia, united fronts are just so not cohesive compared to, you know, either vanguard parties or other kinds of, uh, you, know, you know, more cohesive movements. So it's absolutely not cohesive. And, you know, it's also, you know, it's a very inconvenient fact for those who stress opposition cohesion um, that, I mean, POST split from the opposition before the 2018 election. And in fact, the opposition basically almost always did better when DAP and POST were, were not working in coalition, precisely because it made them more credible with each of their constituencies, right? So what the opposition really was in Malaysia, and this is all through Lynette's book, it's all in there. It's just, she hasn't stressed as much as cohesion, but what it really was, was it was pluralistic. Lynette says over and over again, it was broad based, right? I would really stress that rather than its cohesion. The amazing accomplishment of the opposition was just how pluralistic it was um, and broad based. And they were credible, but the way I would explain what I would say about their credibility was they were credible on, on being peaceful, absolutely. But they were also credible that what they were committed to was democratization. What they were not was either a revolutionary movement and they were not an ethnic movement, okay? That was what it took them all of this time to, to build up. That was the credibility. And when I talked to oppositionists in, after the election in 2013, I was just sort of stunned by how patient they were, how confident they were. I mean, they'd just been completely robbed. They'd won the popular vote. This was totally unfair. I was like, why is there no, I mean, I didn't say this, but it's like, why is there no color revolution? You know, and Nurul Iza and others just, they all said the same thing. They said, no, we'll win in 2018. We're, just look, we're on our way, we'll win. They were just completely patient with it. And, you know, it, it was just, it was really kind of remarkable to me that that, that that panned out. But, you know, and one point here is that on this credibility point, so you're right that Bercy didn't call for regime change until after the 1MDB scandal. But what, what Lu Ching Tong explains very clearly in his book is that what, what Bercy did was it, it birthed the regime cleavage. So what they really did, and they created a regime cleavage in Malaysian politics, basically after the 2004, uh, you know, just got absolutely massacred in that election. And after that, the regime cleavage was really, really vital. Okay, so from this perspective, right, if credibility was about being, you know, democratic and not being ethnic, right, then from that perspective, adding Mahathir to the coalition squandered the credibility. It's not what secured their credibility, okay? For sure, it allowed the opposition to win more rural votes. It allowed them to win more votes among Malay first voters with the weakest, if any, commitment to, to democracy. Um, and of course, the, the irony here, the whole deal was built on the least credible you know, commitment of all time, which was that Mahathir would simply anoint Anwar as, you know, as, as prime minister after, after two years. So I can think I see the Mahathir thing a bit differently you sort of say that bringing Mahathir in was like he was this mythic figure who was only slightly tainted by what he had done against Anwar. I think it was not that he was a myth, at least not among the Bursi types and the opposition types. I think it was closer to the fact that he was the monster, okay? And the reason that bringing Mahathir in was such a big deal was he was the last person you would expect. Like, if we can get Mahathir to support this, like, we have everybody, we have everything. You know, I think that was the idea. So it's almost like a, a Nixon in China kind of moment, right? Like if you could get Nixon to go to China, right? If you can get Mahathir to support Bercy, he of all people, right? And so I think he was in many ways, I think a very weakened figure until he, he, he came back. So, so what does this all mean for the question of like, well, who's to blame? Why did this transition not consolidate? You know, do we put the blame on the opposition for doing this? How do we think about this? Well, if we go back to my point about pluralism, right? So if, if pluralism is really what a democratic opposition requires, and if pluralism is what democracy requires, not cohesion, it requires pluralism, then we really shouldn't blame the opposition, right? They were a pluralistic opposition movement. The only thing you need for democracy to take hold is for them to be a pluralistic, you know, set of, you know, governing elites, right? And to accept, you know, democratic elections. They don't have to be cohesive. You don't need cohesion for democracy. You need pluralism for democracy. So it's the, the people to blame is the old authoritarian elites who basically refuse to be voted out of power, who refuse to, to, to allow pluralism to, to flourish. They're the ones who have made this fail, at least for now. Um, and so basically, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's been a 25 year battle to build democracy in Malaysia. 
the battle continues. And as we, as we think about this, it's not so much a story of, you know, I put a lot of emphasis on cohesion in ordering power and a lot of work on authoritarianism focuses on cohesion. But in a way, I think it's the, the downside is that it, it makes us think too much about how important cohesion is. And at the end of the day, you just can't, you can't expect, you know, true cohesion from diverse opposition movements in a, in a pluralistic society like Malaysia. Each constituency is going to have their own interests, their own needs, their own desires, and they don't have to all be in the same cohesive basket to make democracy work. You, what you simply need, and this is what the, my forthcoming book really emphasizes, what you need is that people accept the fact that they can lose elections, that they, they can lose. If they lose, they will go into the wilderness and they will compete democratically to come back. That's what democratic transition you know, requires in Malaysia or anywhere. That's what's been lacking. But you know, on that, I'll just say it's just such a wonderful read. I, I love how you bring Malaysia into conversation with the color revolutions, showing the contrast between pre and, and post-electoral mobilization. It's a wonderful read. It's, a, it's such an expert treatment of what I think is just one of the most important, um, you know, illustrative and inspiring uh, cases that we've seen in the, the, the past few decades. And so, you know, it, it's a little bit when I go back and, and read and you see, you know, it's, it's, it's 2011 and there's this global Brissi movement. I mean, the, the kind of optimism that, you know, a lot of us felt a decade ago about democratization compared to the, the sort of gloom that I think almost all of us must be feeling about it a, a decade later is really, it's really kind of something else to kind of go back into this time warp and see how different things looked a decade ago. So thanks for the trip down memory lane. <laughs> in a way and congratulations on a wonderful uh, a wonderful book and uh, satu and east west center thanks for giving it the uh, the attention and the limelight it deserves well thank you so much uh, dan for your comments and for of course Lynette's book and presentation um as many of you online know the east west center's mission is in fact to bring americans and asians together to discuss to do collaborative research study and exchange and having such book talks uh, not only promotes our mission sure but what it does is gives us a platform to bring Americans and Asians together to discuss mutual interests and topics, such as democratization, such as the state of politics in various countries in the world, including the United States. So we're delighted to, to have this opportunity. And um, I really do invite colleagues now to use the uh, uh, Q&A function uh, or the chats. This is being live streamed on YouTube. And therefore I will read the questions for the very simple purpose uh, not to inject myself in, but because our YouTube viewers cannot see the questions. So they will not know what uh, folks are commenting on or perhaps responding to. So with that, let me welcome uh, folks. Um, let me uh, start out with a question uh, as, a, as we wait for folks to chime in. So, you know, I'm struck by this. There was, a, you know, as a, just an extraordinarily outsider follower of Malaysian politics all of the excitement about these social movements. Having gone to Malaysia several times in the last decade, um, uh, you know, been there and talked to folks and seen the excitement. Um, I must say, Dan, the state of overall Southeast Asian democracy and uh, openness, it, you know, gets a lot of coverage as negative. So what happened in the Malaysia case that uh, didn't live up to these high hopes and expectations? Um, and can you say something more broadly because of your work on Southeast Asia and of course Lynette too, but how are we to explain this in policy terms as well as scholarly terms? What's happening? Um, is this part of a global, you know, sometimes I read these things which is, you know, this is part of a global populist, a liberal movement. You see it in India, you see it in Eastern Europe, goodness knows, you see it in Russia, et cetera. What are you as very well-informed, deeply scholarly uh, folks, um, what is your take on what's happening? Well, well, Lynette is the guest of honor. I'm definitely gonna let Lynette go, go first. Lynette, why did you start? Yeah. Oh, dear. oh dear. What happened to the trajectory of promise as it were? Um, so, yeah, so I think the great, Great question. And it also touches on wonderful comments that, that uh, Dan has made. Um, I think Mahathir is both a savior and also a villain. Um, when I spoke to Maria Chin Abdullah and a bunch of people that I interviewed right after 2018, she was seen as a savior. A savior that was needed to push Bursi forward, to allow them to win the election. 
uh, but I think in hindsight, they were a little bit under lacking confidence that perhaps they could have won without Mahathir. And Mahathir could appear to be a, a savior, but after winning the election two years later, look what he did, right? Uh, and Mahathir being Mahathir, uh, person doesn't change when you are 20, when you are 93 years old. Um, so, you know, he's, he's an interesting figure and I see this, this whole opposition coalition falling apart as almost his doing that he, he is not able to trust people and he therefore instigate, he, he tendered his resignation to the Agong, which then led to more elite infighting, which is not to say that the, the, uh, the opposition coalition were held together very strongly in the first, in the first place. And the whole thing fell apart and no one knows what happened at the Sheraton Hotel coup. Uh, but they were very ambitious people. People did not trust each other. Um, the whole thing uh, fell apart. But I, but I do want to address one point that uh, Dan has stressed on, which is one of pluralism. And I, and I know what you mean by you know, opposition coalition. Importantly, is pluralism being able to represent all corners of society. But, but in a way, in Malaysia, it's a little bit like Kenya. So the other countries which I find, which I found to be so divisive is Kenya. Kenya has so many ethnic tribal groups, I think more so than Malaysia. And Malaysia politics is, po politics is organized along ethnic lines, along political parties. So if they are not cohesive to some extent, unless you change the electoral system first past the post, they can never win an election. So in, first, it's absolutely right that you need to have pluralism that represents all corners of society, but they need to have some sort of majority which could hang on, which would win election and hang on to power uh, for some time. And then they get booted out as part of the democratic process, which is totally fine. So I think the key is really electoral change, which Bursi had to do, which, but two years is just way too short. So people like myself and a lot of people were very frustrated that, 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 that you know, they wanted to do, but did not get a chance to do it. Um, so I hope that addressed your question. Thank you. Dan, any comments? Because then we can turn to two very well-informed um, uh, uh, comments and questions in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, Dan. Great. Yeah, no, we should get to Q&A as, as quickly as possible. But I, I, I agree, Lynette. And I wasn't, you know, you were there in 2018. I was there after 2013. I unfortunately couldn't be there in 2018. If there was a savior, you know, if that was the, the discourse, I, I believe your, I believe your fieldwork. Um, I guess I'd just say the big, I think the big picture here is one in which, um, to Satu's question, that kind of pluralism is under attack in a lot of places. That's true in Indonesia. That's true in India. And I think it just underscores this point that, again, don't expect your your you know, democratic you know either rulers or opponents to, to, to be cohesive all the time. You know they're going to mm -hmm. argue about things. They're going to compete. That's the point. Um, cohesion is for autocrats. Pluralism is for democrats. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, unfortunately, the more cohesive side, as we're seeing we've seen in, in Johor here, is the is the Barasan uh, national side. So. Um, yeah. but we should, we should get to Q and A. So thanks for the, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, that's the fascinating. And I'm particularly struck as we go to Q and A that Lynette's point that in the end, the social movement, you know, that this one individual played such a role in that process, that even the social movement of social mobilization was affected by, you know, a longstanding elite. She mentioned Dr. Mahathir. In any case, we have um, Adam, uh, please forgive my pronunciation of all these names, um, so, but I'll do my best. Uh, Adam um, Zulkarnaim Mohammed Saeed. Um, hi, Lynette, thank you for your presentation. Based on the research you have done, to what extent was the civil society coalition of interest driven more by anger and resentment against elites rather than genuine sentiment for democratic change? Former PM who has been convicted remains popular in public gatherings while the politics of hope seems to have lost its shine. It seems as though narratives is driven more by emotions, less by principles, question mark. Thoughts, both of you. Lynette, starting with you. Sure, I mean, I think there's a bit of both, but I, I think, you know, civil society organization and leaders, those as far as, as I know, 
people do want democratization in Malaysia one way or the other, and it's actually through institutional change, respected uh, institutional channels. Uh, people are angry uh, for the right reason for a long time, and especially given the possible comeback of, of Najib, um, who has been accused of you know, stealing a lot of funds. So there were, there were strong emotions, none uh, for sure, but I think they are also driven by principles for the fact that they do want uh, democracy in Malaysia. Dan, any thoughts on this? Um, just, just very, yeah, just very briefly, what I would say is you're not going to build a majority in a diverse place like Malaysia by everybody having the same, being in it for the same reason, you know, mm -hmm. so you had people in for very different reasons. Um, a big part of it was absolutely, and this is one reason why it was Brissi and not some other kind of movement that was at the heart of it, a very big part of it was absolutely the desire for a more you know, democratic political, you know, arrangement in Malaysia. But getting over to, to a majority also, you know, again, things like DAP and POS, you know, splitting, it was things like, you know, making sure that the ethnic Chinese, you know, would feel, you know, comfortable with political change. Um, you know, it was things like that as well. And so, um, and then at the end of the day, you know, they, they wanted the insurance policy of, you know, Mahathir being able to, to, to split the, the, you know, the, the old Malay pro BN vote as well. And so it ends up being, even the, even when it was, you know, that a, a relatively cohesive opposition coalition, you know, then you bring in these other elements and then you really, at the end of the day, it's just how broad based, how pluralistic it is, it's not how cohesive it is. So there's no single answer to your question, Adam. It's the whole point is it's a it's a diverse coalition who are in it for all kinds of different reasons. Thank you very much. But it kind of leads to a question from Professor Meredith Weiss, um, who many on this call will know herself a, 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 an expert on Malaysian politics. Um, uh, after giving you greetings, thanks for the great book. Uh, she's wondering about the current fragmentation on both sides of the figurative aisle. At the same time that we've also seen progressively more civil societal mobilization on the communal Islamist right, in quotation marks, do you sense efforts to replicate adversity type progression among BN backslash PN types as a path towards reconsolidation? And if so, well, or if not, is specifically election reform mobilization key? or could another focal point suffice? So this is a question that social mobilization doesn't also always occur, occur on one side of this political spectrum, but social mobilization is open to, to uh, consolidating um, already um, dominant players. How, how does that play? Thoughts, Lynette, first. Sure, uh, hello, Meredith. Um... Uh, you know, Meredith spends a lot of time in Malaysia, more so than I, than I do. Uh, and, and that is a great question. Um, how do you bring a fragmented society together? Uh, um, I, I think this broad-based course is, is difficult to find in, di in divided society. Um, so by scanning through the literature, the one example that I found is constitutional reform movement in Zimbabwe. That you call for constitutional reform, it is not. It is not like any modern social movement that is potentially uh, divisive. Think about the the example like Tea Party in the United States, anti war, even LGBTQ. Some visible groups in society would be left out. But electoral reform is constitutional reform. Do not actually leave anybody out. It's actually meant to be inclusive. And, and that's not a broad-based course. I think it's difficult, difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. uh, so this progressive Islamism is interesting, but I don't know how inclusive that, that will be. Mm -hmm. So my guess is, you know, why don't we go back to Berse and talk about electoral reform since you know we have not actually achieved that? Um, but under current environment. How possible is it? Um, I'm not entirely sure. And after COVID restriction, so COVID restriction has just been abolished or will be abolished in Malaysia soon. I think that allows people to gather again in person and that might facilitate social movements. In the, two and a, the past two and a half years, including the shenanigans when that went on, people were not allowed to get together. Uh, people can only hang white flags. You know, those people in poverty, they needed help to maintain a basic standard of living. It's a different type of uh, resistance when you have COVID going, going on. Dan, any thoughts on Meredith's question to add to Lynette's? I think, yeah, I think the basic uh, 
comment I'd make is that, you know, revolutions breed counter revolutions and that you do see on the right, you know, in red, you know, mimicking in some ways what we saw on the on the left, if you will, in, in yellow, um, mm. you know, in the reverse reverse pattern of Thailand. Um, and I think that the, you know, again, this this speaks to the fact the, you know, it's not just that the status quo ante has been restored. I mean, in some ways it's 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 not quite as cohesive of a of a ruling government. And so it's not as as you know, oppressively authoritarian as it was in the the Mahatma years, certainly. But it's also it's much more nativistic. You know, um, you've basically got Barca Nacional without the the real communal inclusiveness anymore. And so, both in government and in society, you have a much more you know Malay first uh, you know kind of you know ruling coalition at this point. So it's uh, I think it's 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 pretty it's pretty grim, especially when you consider these global trends. You know, and Hindutva and what have you, you have, you know, a Malaysian version of that that's that's ruling essentially and and with less commitment to, you know, competitive elections and pluralism than than in India, certainly. So it's it's certainly worrisome, I think. Hmm. Well, something to watch for. We now turn to um, us, uh, Rabi Amin. How do you think the political fatigue among the public will affect mobilization of social movements such as Bersi? Based on the performance of recent consecutive state elections, it seems that old politics is returning to Malaysia and may cause pessimism of change. Something you both alluded to in the Johor case. Um, I wondered if you had any other thoughts on this. Lynette, any thoughts on this? Uh... Yes, definitely fatigue. Um, yeah. Especially for people who have been involved in say, organizing, participating, um, and towards the end, they were threat of using violence. People risk take took, took on personal risk and professional risk to take part in social mm -hmm. movement. And then when the coalition fell apart, there was dash hope. You know, people waited for a long time for that to happen, and then ah, mm -hmm. someone screwed it up. So political fatigue, but you know, democratization. You know, like Chairman Mao say, revolution is not a dinner party. So we have got to do it. Um, revolution yeah. is not what? Sorry, could you say that again? Chairman Mao was once quipped that you know revolution is not a dinner party. Ah, you know it's well. not something that you could do easily. So, so you know I'm sure the Democrats in Malaysia they have the tenacity to do it, and uh, mm. those people that I know have huge admiration. They have got a lot of tenacity, um, but um, but it's a it's also a very divisive society divided along ethnic cleavages, along economic division of, of labor. And I think there are not that many solutions. Um, and I think Bersi was, a, to my mind, a very creative solution. Um, so I don't know. So I'm waiting for the content for my next next book. <laughs> so this next, next short book, yeah. It, can, I, can I just ask a question apropos this, you know, it's always struck me, again, forgive me for speaking on Malaysian politics about which I know next to nothing, but you know, it's always struck me that Malaysia has you know, all these conversations about Malaysian politics turn on this issue of, as you said, communal linkages, uh, you know, ethnic identities, of course, well known. But Malaysia in some sense also has political economy um, and besides the preferences and the NEP, is there any sign that the nature of Malaysia's political economy is having impacts on these communal groupings and these ethnic identities by fracturing or splitting them in different ways, winners and losers that could over the long term? Because it sounds what I'm hearing in the short term, given the electoral machinations and electoral rules that you know, privilege certain parties and groups, that's not the avenue. But you know, there can be changes when other interest groups develop out of political economy reasons rather than electoral reasons. Is there any sign of that? And could we see a, a Malaysia and CPTPP lead to different structures of the political economy in Malaysia that, that have impacts on these electoral cohesions and, and, and ethnic groups and democracies? Any thoughts before we turn to the last question? Dan? Dan who has studied this, yeah. you know, way longer than than I have would have uh, things to say. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty tough question. I think that in Malaysia, I think politics drives economics more than the, the other way around. Okay. Um, I think that the that what the the NEP system did 
Um, you know, the, the whole idea was, it, the, the point was, you know, the Malays are not going to wind up like the Native Americans. We're not going to wind up like the Palestinians, you know, mm. and what it was there was to, to make, make sure that didn't happen. And that indeed did not happen. And so that's come at a lot of costs as well. But it did, in fact, you know, make sure that Malays would not become totally, you know, marginalized, you know, in their in their own you know, in their own country. Um, that was the point. And so anything beyond that, I think is um, expecting, expecting too much. Mm. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Malaysia is, is still largely, you know, it's a kind of a mix between a natural resource based economy and, you know, kind of low end manufacturing economy. Uh, haven't had a lot of success in upgrading in, in decades. And I think that it's, there's no real reason to believe political will to, to, to do so, as opposed to just hold together this, uh, this kind of shrunken coalition in a way. You no longer have, you know, MCA, MIC, Garakan, this kind of the multi-ethnic coalition of old days. That was a more promising coalitional basis for economic improvement. Um, I think the one today is, a, again, not a very, not a very encouraging one. Oh, well, another reason to be somewhat... Um... Uh, guarded and cautious about progress and change in Malaysia, it seems to me. Uh, we've learned, uh, now turn to our uh, last anonymous attendee comment slash question, and then we will have to end it after your comments um, to respect everyone's schedule and time. Many thanks for the fascinating presentation. In many cases of anti-authoritarian resistance movements, leaders of resistance groups are aware of the necessity to build coalition and remain pluralistic in order to succeed. However, they appear unwilling to make compromises or champion the causes of other groups. Based on your research, both of you, can you share major factors that incentivize or discourage resistance groups leaders from building a truly broad-based movement? This gets back into this whole social mobilization by top-down social mobilization, and they sort of how the leaders manage relations for the greater good, as it were. Thoughts, Lynette? Well, I think most civil society champion narrow causes for what the organization what for what the organization stands stands for, but all of them contributes to democratization, political and social change in some ways. But you also need to have a uniform organization that brings all these things together under its umbrella. And that was what uh Berset did and Reformacy to some extent, but but you know, a more narrow type of Type of type of course, so, um, but to go back to your previous question, um, I think, um, I think Malaysia is also in the middle income trap. I mean, people mm. who study the economy would tell you that education investment has been very far behind. Uh, this these days, you know, middle class Chinese, for instance, if they could afford, they would send their children to international school, not to national schools. Imagine what that does to young people. Next generation, you're bringing up uh, people with weaker nationalism because they don't get to receive uh, national education. And I think the influence of China is another thing to watch out for. Mm. Uh, I think there, because of its divisiveness along ethnic line in Malaysia, China has the, has the capacity to exert its influence, right? Mm. And that might actually change the dynamics of electoral politics in a place like Malaysia. We have mm. seen a bit of that in 20 election. And in a way, 1MDB was facilitated by Chinese companies, right? Mm. They, they allow all these, this underground money to go through. Mm. And, uh, but Singapore government also knew about it. They closed one eye, did not say very much. So, so the big autocrats in the, in the in the region is able to influence, I think, domestic politics in a medium-sized country like, like Malaysia. Fascinating. So that, that does get to a little bit of the political economy question, and that's come up many times, particularly in certain uh, investments that China has made in Malaysia and certain uh, states where well, China has been especially active in Malaysia. So very interesting stuff there. Uh, Dan, uh, over to you. Yeah, I think the I would just say that I think this is a perfect question to end on because the perfect answer to the question is read Lynette's book. Lynette tells you exactly how this happens. And she gives you, I think, the first really in-depth case that, that I've seen that really shows how it was done. And it was an uphill battle. And it was pretty miraculous that they were able to forge, again, a very, very pluralistic you know, coalition around... And they did so by shifting the entire cleavage structure of politics. They made it not about ethnicity. They made it about elections. 
and they were able to do so with remarkable success over a very long period of time. And so I think it's a case we should all be drawing inspiration from in these, you know, in these, these difficult times. It shows you it can be done under extremely difficult odds. And, you know, it's, again, the, the idea is not some kind of perfect coalition or cohesion of interest among opposition. It's about bringing together in a lot of different actors with that shared interest, which was making Malaysia a more level, more democratic place. Um, so read the book and you'll get all kinds of insights. And so I don't want to have the last word, but that's how I think Lynette gets the last word. Her book should have the last word. It's, 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 it's wonderful work. Thank you, Dan. And Lynette, um, we have a link to your book in the chat that we've distributed to everyone. So you know where to order it, encourage you to do so. Speaking of inspiration, I must say that both of you are so prolific. Um, as I was preparing for this, reading your bios, your works, uh, books in progress, books coming out. Um, so we look forward to having uh, both of you, either of you on future programs, please keep us posted. And I will also flag um, for you uh, one other uh, thing. We will be soon working on a series of webinars and publications on Malaysia. So you can be assured that I will be reaching out to you for guidance and counsel on people to get both from the US and international side, but of course also Malaysian colleagues who would be willing to write and speak um, because we're gonna be focusing on a number of countries in the region that I believe to be quite important. And Malaysia is certainly one of them, but may or may not get as much attention in daily discourse in a Washington DC environment. So um, we'll be reaching out. Um, one other flag and advertisement because what would a program be without advertising the next one? And that is on March 16th, I'm delighted uh, that we will have Dr. Prashant Parmeswaran's new book on US Southeast Asia relations. That's more of the international relations, security, defense, diplomacy element. And I will be his discussant. And that program is at 9 a.m. on March 16th. So if you could flag that for your colleagues. If you're not signed up to our newsletter for events, programs, publications, fellowship opportunities, I would please ask you to consider uh, doing so. We cannot put you on our list. It has to be at your, um, uh, you know, at your volition. So thank you all for joining us, not only our wonderful speakers, congratulations, Lynette, on a terrific book. Uh, Professor Dan Slater, thank you so much for taking time to join us earlier this morning since you're in Michigan. And for all our participants, uh, please stay in touch with the East West Center. Be safe, be healthy, be happy, and we will see you soon. Good day. Thank you Thanks, so Satu. much, Satu, and thank you so much, Dan, for discussing. And Sarah, thank, thank you so much for organizing. Thank you, Sarah, thank you, Sarah for organizing. Bye-bye, all. All right.